Well, I think we're all here, or at least those of us that are here are here. Is anybody not here? Raise your hand if you're not here. <laughs> uh, anyway, I want to welcome everybody. Thank you for coming. This is uh, the first in-person meeting we've had in nearly three years, thanks to the pandemic. Is there anybody here that did not get infected by the pandemic. Oh, very good. I wish I could raise my hand, but uh, thanks to my grandson and his family, I got it about two months, three months ago now. Anyway, IHOP uh, is the meeting after the meeting. Okay, uh, I'm going to be teaching, or uh, uh, Bill Rouleau, AE7UI, and I will be teaching the technician and general classes. Uh, the technician classes will start on the 12th, which is next Monday, and the general classes will start on the 21st, which is a week from next Wednesday. Uh, if anybody is interested or they know somebody that's interested, please have them send me an email immediately, if not sooner. Uh, send it to my call sign, AD7SR, that's Alpha Delta 7 Sierra Romeo, at ARRL.net. <clears throat> um, Saturday uh, is this, uh, is that right? No, no, I have that wrong. It's next Saturday. Yeah, that was the day I put this. The 17th is the uh, Davis County swap meet, and there's another swap meet on the 24th in Utah County. And let's see, wait for it to roll over the next one. And don't forget, October 7th through 9th, the 2022 AWR Rocky Mountain Division Convention in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Uh, you can see the info there. Um, and of course, next month, it's homebrew night. Make sure you bring your projects. Uh, let's see here and roll to the next one, which is going to be the STEM one. So. Uh, STEM classes with the scouts at Camp Mapledale, that's kind of a little ways up Payson Canyon. There will be classes on electronics and radio, and we're looking for volunteers. By the way, this is the, how we pay the rent for them storing our tower for us, for uh, Ham Club Tower. So there's a radio class. Uh, contact Eric Windsor, these guys. Uh, if you want any of this information, uh, find me after the meeting, and I can, uh, I'll put this up again, but I'll, you can get this from me uh, rather than scribble it down now if you remember. I don't know who, who Eric Windsor is. I don't know his call. Does anyone off the top of their head? But anyway, so there's that's the radio class and then there's the elect electronics class too that will be taught by our very own um, um, Brett Sutherland and 7KG. And there, it's a ba basic electronics class. There's some um, a jewel thief, a like uh, inverter flashlight kits that we'll be putting together, and of course, don't forget that meetings or elections are coming up in December. I, well, I have you here, and that any board position is fair game, and we are especially looking for program chair people. All right, anybody new to ham radio since our last meeting? Okay, hang on just a minute. I want you to give us your name and call sign and when you got your ticket. My name is Scott Rosenbush, K7HSR, and I got my ticket about two weeks before field day and uh, joined some of the folks here down at field day for the first time this year. And, and I was told to say that I got both my technician and general on the same day. Way to go. All right. Oh, yeah, when you tell us what uh, level you got, too. So, here. 
name? So you're, this is the first time you've been here? Yes. All right. Give us your name then. Zeke Boss. Conrad Boss. All right. The Boss family. Way to go. Welcome. Anybody? There's a new one down there. Okay. Uh, my name is Eric Brown, K1EWB. Um, I was in the process of studying for my technician and general exams when everything shut down. So I had to wait a few months because I didn't really want to do a virtual examination. Um, but haven't done much with, uh, with my general license. I've done a little bit of uh, VHF and UHF stuff. Um, but I'm getting into it more. And this is my first time at the UARC meeting. So. All right, way to go. Anybody get an upgrade in license since our last meeting several years ago? <laughs> okay, we got anybody behind me? No. Yeah, I saw him. I'm just trying to shut the there. Not travel so far. <laughs> okay. Doug Lambert, KD seven N Z A. I upgraded from technician which I got in 2000 to my general in July. Way to go. It gets fun. Congratulations, everybody. Um, those that don't have their licenses, you need to see this guy. He's got the classes. Get you, we'll get you licensed and up and running. All right. Chuck's going to tell us what these are. We have a, a couple of ways of keeping in touch other than the microvolt, which only comes out once a month or less lately. I think we got a handle on fixing that. Gordon's been tough to replace. So one of them is our Facebook page. So facebook.com slash Utah Amateur Radio Club, no spaces. And so we got several hundred people that are signed up on there already, but many of you may not be aware of that. Uh, so if you have a Facebook account, go there and, and uh, subscribe, and you'll get any last-minute information that gets put out. The other is an email reflector through Google Groups. Email address to Utah Amateur Radio Club dash subscribe at googlegroups.com. You'll get back an email that tells you how to sign up, and then... An admin has to improve it, and then you'll be in. But if we send out any emails to uh, to that address, then everybody in the that's on the list gets it. Uh, typically, because it's kind of mixed, and we don't know who's where, any messages that get sent out wind up on both. So if you sign up for either one or both, then we can keep you informed on what's happening. I'm trying to think of the, who's the first presenter. Was it you? Come on down. Trying to remember your name, I think it's James. KK7 AVS, and here he is. Okay, got both hands full. I know, I sure do. <laughs> well, uh, good evening. This is uh, James, KK7 AVS, and I'll be doing your presentation for uh, Elmer's Corner this evening. First off, I would like to talk about SWR, some causes as to why you may have some issues, why it's important to look at, and an easy, inexpensive way to do that. First off, SWR is something the ham community talks about as some kind of demon we need to slay that prevents us from getting out a good signal, and that we should have none at all. This is not totally true. Radio is not magic, it's science. An acceptable range is an SWR of 1.5 to 1. Some people worry about striving to get it lower and may even feel like you have failed if your SWR is closer to 2. But on the contrary, 
Readings like this mean you have done a very good job and it's not super critical to do all of the potentially impossible hard work of getting it lower. If you insist in those ranges, it is close enough for an antenna tuner to help out with the rest. But let's break this down for you with a four watt Baofeng radio and why the serious hams are so concerned about your SWR. Go ahead and go to the next slide. All right, um, what we have here is we have a little bit of chart of some SWR readings. Uh, we have SWR readings, percentage of loss, ERP, effective radiated power, and the remaining watts available. Um, first off, ERP is effective radiated power. I think some of you may be wondering where have I heard that before? And uh, hopefully it was the last time in your shack. Um, because the uh, ARRL uh, frequency allocation chart, uh, the band chart, is something that you need to have by your radio to make sure that you don't go out of your ham privileges, but also to make sure that you don't transmit out of the ham band. There are a few cases on there where you need to be careful about how much power you're transmitting, and it's definitely important to take a good look over that chart and always keep it by your radio. But anyways... Let's go ahead and look at the uh, first reading. Uh, go back one. Let's go ahead and look at the uh, first reading. Um, an SWR of 1.0 to 1, 0% loss, 100% affected radiated power. Uh, all four watts are available to us, and all four watts are radiated out of the antenna. Um, this is a prime example of a perfect lossless theoretical isotropic antenna. But let's, uh, let's talk about a more realistic reading that you're probably going to be getting. Um, let's go ahead and talk about the reading of 1.5 to 1. You have a loss of uh, 4.0 and an ERP effective radiated power of 96% and you have 3.84 watts available to you that are actually being effectively radiated out of the antenna. Um, as you can look, um, about uh, 160 milliwatts are reflected back into your transceiver at that SWR reading. And when that goes back to your transceiver, it gets converted directly into heat. And that's, that's why these, uh, these things get a little warm occasionally. And uh, <laughs> that's why you can't transmit for too terribly long without the heat building up. Let's go to an SWR reading of 2.0 to 1, 11.1% um, loss, an effective, uh, ERP effective radiated power of 88.9, and the watts available, 3.56. So about a half a watt is getting reflected back into your transceiver. It's a little bit worse than uh, the uh, 1.5, but that's probably about as far as you want to go. Things get a little bit more dicey as we move down the list. When we get down to an uh, SWR reading of uh, 3.0 to 1, 25% is lost and 75% is effective radiated power. And we have uh, th about three watts available left to us. With the low wattage of an HT, it's really not as scary as it seems. Even under some pretty bad conditions, it's just a handful of milliwatts being reflected into, back, back into your transceiver. Not that any is good by any means, but this is what makes these, so, uh, these things so darn resilient and long-lasting. But say, for example, you're running a 300-watt rig, and you transmit at an SWR of 3.0 to 1, 25%, 300 watts, 25% uh, of 300 watts is 75 watts coming back into your rig compared to the one watt reflected when using the HT at the same SWR. Well, it's not good, let's say, and you'll definitely have a toasty burn-up rig. Common causes could be loose coax, inadequate and, or damaged coax, too many barrel connectors to splice too many pieces of coax, causing impedance bumps, bad or non-resonant uh, ground plane, or bad grounding and bonding scheme causing ground fault loops and noise too. 
Your antenna could also be to blame not being high up and clear of the ground or other objects, or even being just a little bit out of tune, too long or too short. These are things we can work on and fix, but it's good amateur practice to check your SWR. The best way is to use devices like antenna analyzers specifically made for ham radio or directional watt meters. Your antenna, uh, let's see, these devices can be expensive sometimes and out of reach to most hams unless they know a friend or belong to a club that has one. All right, let's go ahead with the next one. The alternative I want to talk about tonight is the Nano VNA, a small inexpensive device for under $70 that we need to get serious about in the ham community. In the May 2020 edition, this device, uh, uh, QST Magazine reviewed this device and declared it an accurate and trustworthy instrument. <laughs> this device is a vector network analyzer. What's a VNA, you ask? <laughs> it's not an antenna analyzer, but a device that is part hardware and part software. It has an input and output for tes uh, testing a device, but it's not straight as straightforward as first for our purposes in ham radio and takes a little bit more work to use. Next slide. A vector network analyzer is an instrument is an instrument that measures the frequency response of a component or network comprised of many components, which can be both passive and active. A VNA is a complicated device that can generate a sweeping frequency and can measure many types of things on the input or output that come back from the DUT, which stands for device under test. Many of these values that come back are well beyond the scope of ham radio and are not needed but it's easy to change what's on display and to do simple things like get the SWR and impedance measurement from your setup. Next slide. These devices are especially useful if you have the knowledge to understand a Smith chart displayed right on screen, which can plot out impedance and reactance across a selected band of frequencies. These charts are useful and can even help you determine the impedance of an unknown piece of coax cable. Most hams would like to throw the other stuff to the curb and calculate the SWR, which you can easily set the device to do and measure reflectivity off the top output port of the device. By changing the format to SWR in the display setting, uh, but with this added complexity comes some other challenges. You need to calibrate this device every single time you make a measurement. It can store the calibration for a long period of time, but you should recalibrate every few hours when you take readings. The sensitivity of this device will alter the accuracy of your measurements, making tuning adjustments over a longer period of time a bit harder. Temperature changes or other factors can throw off your precise readings. The device comes with three connectors an open, a short, and a load. From the menu, you can go ahead and select calibrate. Next slide. And you can select calibrate, then you can calibrate the three values needed for ham radio applications. Calibration can also change the reference point of measurement, meaning you can calibrate with your selected coax attached, and it'll take it out of the measurement. My most recent measurement was of my half-wave vertical 10-meter antennas SWR, mounted on my roof that I use for the Salt Lake Crossroads Amateur Radio Club SDR. On the screen, next slide. On the screen, it shows at the bottom of the S... Oh, go back one, sorry. On the sc uh, screen at the bottom of the SWR curve, it shows that the antenna is most resonant on 29.700 megahertz with an SWR of 1.42 to one, indicating I need to lengthen my antenna at least 5% or so to get the frequency down between the single sideband and FM portions that I use it for. It also shows that my impedance is at 41.55 ohms, a bit shy of 50 ohms, 
leading me to suspect that I need to work on maybe my ballon a bit or the antenna's ground plane. The impedance is shown directly on the Smith chart across the frequency sweep we're looking at. And in this case, it's 25 to 35 megahertz. Matching the, antenna's uh, matching the antenna impedance with the system impedance is critical for maximum power transfer. We try to match the impedance of that to our feed line, which is approximately 50 ohms. If we have an imbalance, very simply to put it, it causes reflectivity, which is what the SWR reading is derived from. The impedance circling on the chart has a meaning. The top half of the Smith chart circle represents inductance. The bottom half of the circle representing capacitance. And the further to the left of the circle, the lower the impedance. And the further to the right of the circle, the higher the impedance. The center of the Smith chart is 50 ohms. This, honestly, is a really cool gadget. If this thing works, then why is it so cheap? Next slide. <laughs> I got mine, the H model, for around about $40. It's a bare bones unit consisting of exposed PC boards, and it's a bit fragile. Not something you can throw into a backpack and take on a QRP D expedition, though I see no problem with making a nice case for it to protect it from the dust and mud to keep it from getting to the components. And there are some really cool ones out there that start for $12. Next slide. But in short, seriously look into this device. It's accurate, and it's a great place to start when brand name analyzers are out of reach. SWR is going to be something that's very important for you as you grow into a ham. Branching off into HF, using a higher wattage than an HT, or want to get into the exciting niche of QRP, making sure that every single milliwatt gets out onto the air. Thank you for your time. Show me the NBA. That's the size of it. So, little tiny thing. If it's in the right. If it's in the right case, you can put it in your pocket. So, good job. Thank you. All right, and the next person is Jerry, and he's going to talk to us about the political aspect of AM radio, a.k.a. new uh, legislation that's coming up, right? So Clint's going to bring up my slides. Yourself. Yeah, I'll do that. So um, I'm Jerry Brummett, WJ3RI. Um, I hold an amateur extra. Um, that being said, I'm probably only qualified to operate a 10 can and a string, and only when properly, um, you know, supervised by somebody like Clint. Um, so this is not going to be a technical presentation, um, but um, this is how you can get in touch with me. I currently serve the section as your state government liaison, and I'm one of the four uh, assistant section managers with the ARRL. And so I've been responsible over the last few years of fighting some of our battles in the legislature and other places, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about, you give me the next slide? Yeah, so, um, you know, I'm, what I'm not really going to talk about is politics, at least politics in the way most of you are thinking. I don't care who you vote for. Now, I do care whether you vote or not, but I don't care who you vote for. I don't care what party you're from. And none of this is going to talk about that. Um, you know, ham radio operators, we tend to avoid politics like the plague. And a lot of us who teach uh, ham radio classes, one of the things we'll talk about is, gee, 
Don't talk about politics, religion, and other controversial topics on the air. It's not that you can't. It's just kind of bad form. And so we avoid these topics. And um, so tonight, I want to argue that that may not always be the best advice. And um, I want to suggest that what I want to, or what I'm going to talk about is advocacy, and again, not a political party. I want to talk about ham radio and how we advocate for ourselves. Because if we don't do it, no one else is going to. And ham radio nationally, actually internationally, as well as in Utah and the Utah legislature, as well as in local communities, continues to find ourselves under threat. We lost a whole lot of spectrum in five gig. And people are going, well, you know, it's because, well, us ham radio people, you know, we don't have a billion dollars to auction off on the bandwidth, so that's why we lost it. That's not why we lost it. We lost it because ham radio did a very poor job of explaining who we are and why that bandwidth was important. And when we got trying to do something about it, and this includes the league, which I'm a, you know, tied to, we did a terrible, terrible job. And it's because we are not advocating for amateur radio. And so that's what I'm going to talk about. Next slide. And so advocacy, you know, and the word lobbying comes up. They're not exactly the same thing. But the idea of advocating for something you believe in is incredibly important. In fact, people talk to us, amateur radio, and they go like, you know, we're the radio operators that aren't as good as the professional operators. We are, in the common use of the term, the professional radio experts in the country, if not the world. They're all amateur radio operators. We are the experts. Amateur has its history in the concept of loving something. That's where the etymology of the word comes from. And I'm going to take it because you're out on a Thursday night that you care about this hobby and this um, activity that we spend so much money and time and effort on. And we get up in the middle of the night to make a weird contact someplace else because the muff's in the right place. You know? Um, so we, gotta, we care about this thing. And we talk to each other about it. And we can all explain why it's important to me or important to, you know, somebody who does something I don't do. I don't do de-expeditions. I'm, you know, I'm not in that good a shape and stuff like that. But, you know, we can explain why that might be cool and important. But we're not sharing that. We're not advocating in the way that we should. And, you know, amateur radio is a science-based hobby. And like all science-based things, it's predicated on provable, measurable, repeated facts. I mean, the potential of, you know, the high potential of the wolf hong that no doubt affects my DX proposition, you know, propagation, you know, has some sort of black magic in there that I'm not sure I fully understand, but I'm getting away from the topic. You know, the point is like all hobbies in science and engineering were based on facts and the free discussion and sharing and debating of the value of an analyzing those facts, the interpretation of those facts, and fact-based opinion. And all you got to do is go to any ham fest, and you're going to find all kinds of opinions. Our colleague tonight was talking about the nano VNA. Oh my God, you get about five or six hams talking about this device, and they're all going to have different opinions on which one and why, and, you know, and it's all opinion-based, but it's fact-based opinion. And we're good at discussing these things and advocating for why my idea is better than your idea and why my radio signal goes further than yours. We're good at this. So we know how to advocate, at least among ourselves. And so, really, what I want us to do is to talk about ham radio within a larger community that we're all uh, part of. Can I get the next slide? 
So advocacy is not about being partisan. It's not about dirty candidates, and I, and I do that. So some of you know that I'm deeply involved in politics. I just sold my lobbying firm in Washington, D.C. I was there when the Dobbs decision came down on a totally unrelated matter, and the next thing I know, I'm meeting with um, Senator McConnell and his senior staff over the Dobbs decision that came down. So I'm into politics, I love this stuff. But you know, sometimes, well, actually every time when I'm done with it, I need to get in the shower and scrub with you know, some really serious soap, right? Because it's a dirty, nasty business. So I'm not trying to drag you guys in the mud of politics. But I do want you all to engage with the larger community. Because right now, most of ham radio sits in a ham radio echo chamber. And we talk to each other, and we know why we're important. And we know why this thing we care about. And actually, we're pretty broad in that area, because we are the STEM hobby that's getting all kinds of talk in the press, and in education, and everywhere else. We are STEM on steroids. That's what we are. But we talk about it among ourselves. And we listen to each other. Oh, and we grumble about stuff that's happening to us. And we don't do a bloody thing about it. In fact, we sit on the sidelines and watch stuff happen to us. And I get calls. Um, go ahead, go to the next slide. I get calls every week, not every couple of weeks or whatever, from somebody jumping up and down and wanting me as the state government liaison to do something about what's being done to some ham radio operator someplace by some local government or by the state. And advocacy, a lot of people in ham radio and say, you know, oh, by the way, the league is a 501c3, as this club is. Oh, we can't advocate, we can't be in politics. Advocacy is a major pillar that underpins ARRL. And this is an ARRL club. And this is one of the oldest clubs in the Western United States, filled with a history of experts in our avocation. And if we don't advocate, no one's going to do it for us. And so, you know, um, just recently, a couple of years ago, um, in fact, Mel, uh, our former section manager, tapped me to, to come in and um, try and prevent uh, one of the senators who, for her fifth year in a row, was trying to pass a distracted driving law in Utah. And that distracted driving law would have prevented any handheld use of a microphone. Now, I didn't say it that way, but that's what it said. That's what it did. And no one, they were a little worried about it, but they didn't realize what it really meant. In fact, Mel did. He said, it's just a bad idea because, you know, somebody could pull over an amateur radio guy for having his hand on a radio. Or maybe echo linking through their phone, you know, and, and that'd be bad. No, I said, you don't see what the real problem is. In fact, other radio users in the state, like UPNL, that, oh, that's the old name for them, you know, you tell Pilfer and lie, um, but, the, but UP the railroad, Dominion Energy, all of these folks use radios, all the people who use the commercial bands, all the folks using GMRS and FRS, all the CB guys, particularly the CB guys, because as a trucker who hauls hazmat by law in Utah, you have to have a CB in your rig. Now, you don't have to turn it on. You don't have to know how to use it. But by law, you have to have a CB in there if you haul hazmat. And it would have been illegal to use that. Now, the bill carved out an exception for cops. They could use radios and stuff like that, but we couldn't. And it was the amateur radio community that had the expertise to go, whoa, 
this is what this means. This is the impact. And we were able to put that down. Um, and it came back um, this last year in a different guise with language that we wrote in Utah, and it is now language and law that's, that specifically exempts mobile radio under Part 90, Part 94, and Part 97. So the amateur radio community went and protected all the commercial users, all the children's band users out there. We protected everybody, and you can use your radio in your car while driving. And we did that not because we have some big political power or I have dollar bills flowing out my pocket or anything else like that, because we were able to advocate and educate on the difference between half duplex radio communications, which you guys all understand what I said. Your average legislature goes, huh, what is that? But how your brain processes things differently when you're doing half duplex versus full duplex. And so those folks on radios that we call cell phones, remember most of the population has no idea that's a radio. Um, and that there's a difference. And so we were able to educate and advocate and change that. But also last year, we almost lost the amateur radio license plate. In fact, I told several people who called, I think we've lost this one. I think we're going to have to throw in a towel on it. Um, because it wasn't amateur radio license plates per se they were after. They weren't after us. They were after every plate that was a custom plate, unless it was a legislative plate, of course. They were going to be exempted. And the governor's plate, right? Because the governor might not sign it if you take his plate. Um, but they were going to take our plate because, remember when we first got the U of U plate and the BYU plate because two legislators decided that they wanted to get their alma maters a little more money out of people who were registering their cars? Well, now we have several hundred of those in the state. And the state prints lots of stickers. They, they went to stickers. They were originally um, doing them with, with um, uh, you know, silkscreen or whatever. But the, the upshot of that is it's costing a ton of money. And a lot of these organizations are using these monies pretty questionably. I mean, I don't know about the U, but probably the U being very questionable um, since we're in their, in their venue. But so the idea was, well, we're going to put this all on hold. And I got all these guys telling me the day before the vote, what are you going to do about it? And I said... Do you know your senator? Do you know your member of the house? No. Do you know what district you're in? No. I said, dude, we've lost. Game over. Now, luckily, there were some advocates for some of these other causes out there. So I didn't do anything to save us. But there were other advocates. And they got out and they educated. And the simple answer to educate them was, guys, you don't have to put a moratorium on it, cancel all these plates for a few years while you figure out what to do. You know, go tell the DMV to go out, figure out what other states have done with this problem, come back with a solution, and then we'll figure it out and leave stuff alone. But it's going to come up in this coming legislature. And it may or may not get through. But we may lose our amateur radio plate. But who cares? Because some of us, not me, because my call sign isn't a KI, but a lot of you that have gotten your license in the last, what, three, four, five, eight years, have a KI-7 prefix on your call sign. And so many cops in Utah, in fact, they're trained, or they were up until recently, to read KI-7 is K-1-7. And so they kick this into their laptop, and it comes up as a fraudulent plate, which is a felony. And oh my God, Officer Friendly is going, oh my God, I get to do a felony stop. That means I get to pull my gun, and other people get to come, and I get the lights on. It's really exciting. <laughs> because they can't tell the difference between a one and an I, and they're trained. Don't worry, there's not any plates with that except there are 
on custom plates, but most of those spell a word. And so the cops don't get that. So I know a young lady that got pulled over three separate times on a felony stop, guns drawn three separate times with that license plate. So I'm out here getting all these calls and I need some help. I need some advocates. And that's what I want to talk to you guys about. I want to recruit you to protect your own hobby and to protect your fellow hams everywhere, particularly here in Utah. Next slide. So for those of you that have watched any of my presentations on anything or taken a college class from me, you will know that I beat the concept of engineering discipline and engineering response because I am theoretically a professional engineer. And engineers look at things and say, you know, we've got this concept. We better understand a problem. We figure out some solutions that, you know, should be practical and cost effective because we'd like to keep our job. And then we take a look at that solution and say, how well did it come to solving the problem? Because after all, we need a version two, three, four, keep the product fresh, you know, keep the models moving because that's good for, for business too. So engineers, this is what we do. And so, um, as I look at things, the first thing to do is take a look at the problem. What is the problem that I'm really talking about tonight? Next slide. And it's our appearance. Jeff Foxworthy does a little bit, and he talks about his cousin losing his job at the Waffle House on the account of his appearance. And anybody from the South is laughing. The rest of you are going, what does that have anything to do with anything? But the Waffle House is a, on, on interstates, there'll be four Waffle Houses on all four corners of an interstate exit in places like Georgia. And the people who cook in those places on the account of their appearance is saying something. But our appearance, here we are, I told us that we're experts, because I'm one of us and you know, I'm gonna be an expert too. We're all experts here. I mean, I got a real expert here, but, you know, and oh, Ron's over there too. I mean, these guys have forgotten more than I know. But this is how people look at us. When I talk to people, and you tell me if this isn't what you hear out of people who know nothing about ham radio, and they say, so what are you into? And you say, well, I'm into amateur radio. And they look at you and you say, like ham radio. And they say, oh, people still do that? Because we're ancient. Oh my God, we're troglodytes. We're cave dwellers. And we're viewed that way. Now, each and every one of you can tell me why we're not Stone Age, you know, analog hangovers from, you know, keys on kites. You can all tell me this. You can all discuss it. We all grumble about people saying these sorts of things about us, but by God, we're about to lose our hobby on the account of our appearance. And not how we appear to each other, but how we appear to everyone else. And so, we're just not viewed as relevant or important. In fact, our use of the five gigahertz spectrum was not viewed as important compared to 5G, you know, and maybe it isn't, but why didn't we get some of the government spectrum or why didn't we get some of the other things? And oh, by the way, 5G wouldn't have worked at all without, you know, a, a, a very old lady person now named Hedy Lamar, you know, um, a ham radio operator, of course, not to mention gorgeous movie star, but, and all these other folks through history there have been amateur radio operators that have made a difference in the field, and we still make a difference in the field. I mean, I saw one of Clint's um, coils around a, a piece of um, PVC core that uh, he was down in some low spectrum that, you know, I know nothing about that had obviously sh um, shorted out, and there must have been some smoke and something that smelled expensive, but I only saw the aftermath of it. But this type of research is going on. We're doing things that matter. Just nobody knows it. Next slide. 
So I've talked about some of these threats that have happened to us. Okay, down in Utah County, there's an individual who made the mistake in the first place, like my New Ham uh, friend that I'm Elmering up there, um, who made the mistake of calling the inspectors to take out a permit um, rather than asking for forgiveness afterwards. Um, but he went through a permitting process and got a permit to put his 50-foot um, automatic self-rising cool tower that he spent a big chunk of his retirement money on because he always wanted one with a really cool antenna on top. I mean, I've got serious antenna envy. But when he put it up, even though it was in all the drawings and everything else, in some um, you know, rotational aspects of it, he can be as much as 24 inches over the property line into the tree area on the, high, on, the, on the road in his little neighborhood. Now, they approved it and signed it, but they sent him a note telling him he's got to tear it all down. Now, he called me all upset and wanted me to do something about it. And I said, oh my God, you didn't call us before you went for a permit. I could have helped you then. I said, do you know a city councilman? Do you know somebody up for re-election in, in the city government? Do you got a friend in the planning and zoning department? No. And really, the reason he was calling is because his wife was incredibly upset that he'd spent about a fifth of their retirement money to get this tower, and now was being told to tear it down. And so he figured he was screwed. But by bringing me in, I could placate the wife that he was actually doing everything he could, and this was wildly unfair. But the issue is, if he knew people in the city, and I'm not saying that he would have gotten a different outcome on the understanding of things, but he would have had somebody to say, the city screwed up. So he had to hire a lawyer and a bunch of other things because the city screwed up and approved it in the first place before he put the concrete in the ground and put the thing up. Their signatures and stamps are all over everything he did. He did everything right. So the city attorney, because he got into this late, finally decided to give him a letter that says, well, he can use his antenna as long as it's between the hours of 9 p.m. and 9 a.m., which isn't that bad because he wants to DX, and so there's, you know, BDI late night people. I'm not one of them. Um, but, you know, I, I get it. But he can, he can only rotate his um, very fancy rotator. I mean, it's the coolest tail twister I've ever seen. Um, he can only rotate it partial directions. And I do have a solution for him. I said, will you plant some trees in the parking step? Because once those trees get up a little ways, they won't be able to measure whether it's over the street or not. And for God's sake, don't violate the letter for the first 18 months. Because all your neighbors and everybody else will get bored. But the reality is, if we were advocating correctly, this never would have happened. Because in Utah state law, they have no jurisdiction over towers. Oh, by the way, they told him he couldn't put his tower next to his house. He had to move it eight feet away because it was a potential fire hazard to his house. <laughs> How many of you have your towers eight feet from your rafters? Not me. I mean, that's my handy dandy, you know, always in, in place ladder to get up to get to my gutters, right? Um, and so, you know, we mostly put them right by our house. And there's no reason, but again, he went to a bunch of building inspectors who have no idea what they're talking about, or there's a state law that precludes them from getting involved in this. They can make you pull a permit for your foundation. They can make you get a wet stamp signature from a proper engineer to put up the foundation. But what you put on top of that foundation, as long as it's for amateur radio, don't try and pay for it by letting the local cell company use it or anything else, because then all the rules are off. But in Utah, you can do that, unless, of course, you're in an HOA. And everybody calls me about HOA rules. And I say, do you know a legislator? No. 
would you be willing to go up to the Capitol with me and talk to one? Oh, well, when would I have to do that? What would I have to say? And so, it's a dirty business. It really is. But it's one of those things where you're either going to do it unto them or they're going to do it unto you. And you've got to ask yourself a question. Are you happy having it done unto us right now? Next slide. So, we got the what you know covered. Everybody in this room has the knowledge, has the passion to be a knowledgeable content matter expert on amateur radio and why we are the coolest hobby out there next to my Harleys, but certainly ahead of my Jeep, right? But it's who you know. And our opportunity is bringing those two things together. Next slide. And what I'm asking you to do isn't going to take a ton of time. I am not asking you to go spend 45 days at the legislature, which I do. I am not asking you to fly to Washington, D.C. on a regular basis or take convert calls from congressmen in the middle of the night who have done something wrong on Craigslist and need your advice to get out from under it. Okay, I'm not asking you to do any of that. I do that. Well, I used to. I sold my company just recently. So, but I'm still getting calls because now that I'm fully retired for the third time, apparently I have nothing better to do than do what I used to do for money for free. But, let's see. No, um, yeah, so where am I? Sorry, I get lost sometimes. And so, again, I'm back to this thing of we've got a problem. You don't have a ton of time. You'd rather, I mean, talk to a legislator or a city council person or get on the air. This is not difficult for most of you to decide, right? Or maybe sort out the parts drawer that you've been meaning to to find all the little things you forgot that you love that you have, right? I mean, we'd all do that rather than talk to a politician or talk to a community leader. But a really simple cost-effective solution is for us to do what we know how to do. Next slide. And that is, we need to use CQ, calling all stations, calling everybody, you know? We need a political QSO party, and not QSOs on the radio, because they don't talk to us on the radio. They don't even know they exist, except the cell phone they're using is a radio, but they don't know that. And by the way, don't try and explain it to them. It's way beyond their technical ability. The whole idea that things go in magically into this box and come out on the other side, a miracle occurs. That's, that's the block diagram they want to understand. But we need eyeball QSOs. Now most of us go, oh my God, no, I can talk on a radio. Unless you're a new ham, right? Then you got Mike Fright. But we, can, we need to do eyeball QSOs. We need to meet these people. And we need to talk to them. And the thing is, they live in your neighborhood. All the people we need to talk to. Next slide. Again, what I'm saying is we need to get to know our elected leaders. Okay? So what do I want you to do? I want you... Well, election season is on us. My God, political signs are popping up on the overpasses, right? Like mushrooms. Okay, 60 days to the election. Okay, that's happening. By the way, this is, everybody's going, oh yeah, right, U.S. Senate. Who's going to control the U.S. House? Who's going to control the U.S. Senate? I love Biden, I hate Biden. I love Trump, I hate Trump. Again, I don't care who you vote for. Please register to vote. And please vote. Okay, just do that because that's something that they told you in second grade was a duty of citizenship. And I don't care who you vote for. I care who I vote for. And if you want opinions, they're freely available from everybody. Just ask. Okay? So this isn't about getting out to vote. This isn't about going and finding candidates. 
and figuring out where they stand, Mike Lee happens to be on the Commerce Committee. The Commerce Committee owns the oversight of the FCC. And the FCC was jacking me around a while back. And I called up Mike. And Mike and I aren't getting along right now. And Mike said, well, I don't know if I want to do anything for you. I said, Mike, I know where a couple of political skeletons are buried. Some of them are still ripe and rotting. I said, you owe me a bunch of favors. And I said, but that's not what I want you to do. And that's not what I'm going to call. I said, I want you to call one of the commissioners of the FCC. And I want you to make the FCC follow the Code of Federal Regulations, which they wrote for themselves. Black letter, what's written? All I want is equal protection under the law. And I'm tired of hearing you talk about the Constitution and your dad telling you at dinner about how important it is and how important equal protection is and all this other stuff. And he said, well, I guess I could do that. Wow, I happen to know a United States senator. I know like 20 of them. It really didn't help that much, but it did get my problem solved. And I'm not asking you to be that connected. In fact, I don't care if you look up who's running for Senate or the U.S. House seats. Because what goes on in Washington, you got the league. They're not great at it. I mean, they missed the thing in the farm bill two years ago that said, oh, if you have a communications facility on federal land, the Forest Service should chart, you know, stealing your money. Okay, two years ago, but, but, you know, it was a big deal last year. It was, you know, the VHS society, everybody else was jumping up and down. But it was in there two years ago. I missed it, too. League missed it. But, you know, on the national level, we've got the league to do this. This is one of the reasons you send them money. It's not just the newspaper or the magazine you get. I mean, that's the real reason to send the league money. And they don't provide any money for the section. I've seen the section budget. Oh, my God. It's like one and a half tanks of gas for Pat. That's the entire bloody budget, I swear to God. So, I mean, I don't want you to, I want you to figure out who's running for your school board. You say, what's school board got to do with amateur radio? I want you to find out who's running for sheriff, okay? In Salt Lake County, we got two people running for sheriff. Sheriff Rosie and potential Sheriff Nick. Okay, I've got an opinion. I can tell you who to vote for. I can tell you why. I don't care who you vote for. Vote for one of them. But call them both up. Go to a rally. Not because you want to find out where they stand and figure out who to vote for. I want you to go up to them and say, Hi, my name's Bob, and my call sign is K-Bob, and I'm into amateur radio. I want you to introduce yourself to them. Now, the ones that are already incumbents, that would be great, too. But get both sides. I want you to find out who's running for legislature in your neighborhood, because they live near you. And I want you to meet both. And if there's three candidates, meet all three. And just introduce yourself. Let them know you're into amateur radio. Don't threaten them saying, I vote. You know, you don't need to do that. Just introduce yourself and that you're involved in ham radio, and better yet, kind of where you live. You know, and if it's, a, if it's somebody running for the Utah House, you know, I live six streets over from you in the big purple house with the huge tower, right? Because I want you to recognize these people. I want you to introduce yourself. And right now, because the political signs are out, they're easy to meet because they want to meet you. So take advantage of that. Oh, you should do it because it's civically minded and the right thing to do. But this is about doing what's in our interest. Introduce yourself. And you say, well, shouldn't I wait until after the election? Maybe I should meet them before because that way I can say, oh, I voted for you when I met you before. No, that's not why. On both sides of the ballot are people that are movers and shakers in the community. They are community leaders and community decision makers. I want you to know them. 
and one of them's going to win in each of these races. Know who they are. Introduce yourself. And then, when you see one at the local Piggly Wiggly, we don't have those here, but I love Piggly Wiggly grocery stores. But, you know, you go to the Kroger, the Smiths, the whatever, and you go in, and they're shopping, and you say, Congressman or Senator. And I'm talking about State Senate, not, you know, you don't have to, Mike Lee doesn't shop in the grocery store anymore. That's way beneath him. And Mitt Romney's never been in a grocery store because, <laughs> you know, he had people to do that for him. Um, so, I mean, I'm talking about, you remember the State House, Representative, Representative Smith. I'm Bob, K. Bob. I'm the ham radio guy with the big tower on the pink house. I painted it. Because after a while, they're going to know you. And you see, you're the expert. We are the experts on all things RF. So who should be educating members of the legislature? By the way, you don't have to do this for a whole year. I mean, do your House and Senate candidates for the Utah House and Senate. And do um, the sheriff and, you know, the county council and the DA. If crime's too high, think about that. Meet those people, right? I want you to meet them, particularly the sheriff candidates. Because in MCOM, we talk a lot about it. We have Aries. Oh, God, Aries is so cool. And they get patches, and they wear yellow vests. And, you know, they're like a bad Boy Scout troop. Nobody calls them to go out and reel incidents. They don't get pulled out on massive wildfires. Because nobody wants us. Because we're troglodytes who show up with 40 antennas and our little you know, Swiss Admiral uniforms, okay? But we know that when all else fails, the only thing that works is amateur radio. And if you want to see something really scary, you watch a bunch of firefighters try to put up an antenna. Firefighters are the only folks that can take a six-inch steel I-beam and a rubber mallet and bend it by accident. <laughs> we are the experts. And that legislature member should be calling you on anything RF. And if they know you, oh yeah, I got a crazy radio guy down the road from me. When I'm mowing the lawn, he's walking his dog and he says, hi, I'm Bob, K-Bob. And I don't get the K-Bob thing, but you know, he's a radio person. He talks to me, and he talks to me about MCOM. He talks to me about these things, and he thanks me for my service. Always thank them for their service, because it's a thankless job. I was on the board of adjustment, and this lady came in, and she screamed at me about, she was in this horrible clapboard, terrible house, and they were building this really nice planned unit development across the street. And she was talking about how it was going to ruin the neighborhood. Two years later, she's in because they're gonna do another one, and she hates that one, and why can't they build something like the one across the street? And I said, ma'am, you don't remember me, do you? I remember you, you were the one that hated that. And I said, you'll love this one too. I vote aye. So these folks will remember you if you treat them with some respect and just get to know them, and they are your neighbors. They work for you. And that's what I want you to do. Because the bottom statement there is everything. They respond to people they know. And if the only people they know are from Motorola, and the reason that nobody wants us is because Motorola and NEC and these folks are selling systems that have a third of the capability of a Baofeng, right, for $10,000 a radio all over. I mean, anybody knows anything about you can and some of this knows, Jesus, the state spent a ton of money on crap that don't work. Hell, I could, I could knock this thing together with a little solder and stuff in my toolkit and do something twice as good. 
but we're not the experts. We're not invited to the table. We're on the sidelines. Next slide. I'm going to run out of time here quickly if I don't get to. So where to go find this stuff? Go to Ballotpedia. Okay? Sample ballot lookup. Next slide. And you can see who's running for, oh, the U.S. Congress and all of that. All I care about is who's running in my House and Senate race. And unfortunately, you've got to go to two places, Ballopedia, to run, get the statewide races. Next slide. And you can go to ballotready.org. I'll make these slides available so you don't have to write this down. But figure out who's running for county council, who's running for attorney and sheriff. And I keep bringing up attorney and sheriff. Okay, I don't want to speak against Sheriff Rosie. I knew her when she used to go to the Versaterm conferences as a records clerk. Great um, cop shop conference, you know, with great software and stuff like that, that for, for doing cop shop neat stuff. And she's a lovely woman. But how many ham radio operators are tied to the Salt Lake County Sheriff's Office? There's a hell of a lot more in Davis or up in Cache County, or down in Washington County, and we're the biggest county in the state. We got more ham radio operators than anybody else. Sheriff's not interested in us. Now, I'm not telling you not to vote for Rosie, but guess what, what if you said, hey Rosie, I'm an amateur radio operator. And by the third time she's met you, she's going to those amateur radio people. And now, were heard. There's, I, I met some of those. Those people are out there. Maybe I should listen to them. Or maybe, Rosie's not going to listen to us, but maybe somebody down in her tech squad is, and we're going to get an opportunity to do what we want to do, which is be meaningful in our communities. That's why we do MCOM. Otherwise, we can just make you know, contacts and contests. Right? So these are important races. Next slide. And so if you'll do this, and a year from now, if you will look at, so in the off-year elections, we do municipal elections. That will be mayors, the council people, you know, the school board people, the council people. By the way, they're going to be the people. If you want to stop corruption in Washington, make sure you don't have any corrupt people on the school board. Because in about four election cycles, that's going to be who's serving in Washington, D.C. Okay, so pay attention to your school board election. They are taking more money out of your pocket than anything the federal government's doing. I swear to God. And they're doing it with nobody watching. Figure out who these people are. Get to know them. Follow up after the election and say, hey, congratulations on getting elected. Thank you for serving so that they know who you are. And honest to God, they're going to know your first name. They're good at this. They're not like amateur radio operators that go, what's that guy's name? I think his call sign is. Okay, they're good at this. That's why they're in politics. Okay, they're going to know your name. So then, when we have an issue at the legislature or in a local government, I can put people together. And I can have them... I, you can say, hey, you know, I live down the road from you. I met you at the supermarket last week. I said, hi, at the supermarket last week. I want to talk to you about HB whatever. One more slide. Okay. And so, two things. I want you to advocate in the way I'm talking about. And if you don't do it, nobody else is going to do it. The other thing is, I would love your club to find someone who isn't tied up in 47 other things, because the person that I've been working with in this club is tied up in 47 other things, that wants to maybe enter in the political arena a little bit and help, because I need to be able to call people and say, hey, I need three or four or five of us up at the legislature, and you know, two guys aren't gonna be able to make it because they gotta work and this and that and the other thing. I need to be able to, be able to call people so it's not me completely alone, okay? Again, if it's not you, who? Next slide. Next slide. OK. 
Okay. And, you know, I'll be here after the meeting to talk to anybody that wants to talk. Thanks for hearing me out. Thank you, Jerry. A lot of information, a lot of things to think about. Keep it in mind. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, we're going to have the same uh, meeting next month, same place, uh, the first or second Thursday of the month. And uh, we thank everybody for coming out and supporting the club, and especially those that are online watching us. We appreciate your participation. Uh, is there any comments that we need to bring up from the no. them? Okay. All right, we'll see you next month. And remember, if you want to go, we'll meet you up at IHOP here in a few minutes. And uh, thank you very much.